were on <coughs> like either some kind of electrical contacts or rubber pads or something so that as the audience looked at the film say that a certain number would lean in one direction and that that like activated little bulbs in the projection booth that indicated that the audience was thinking about oh because the audience was all supposed to be sitting in things like a dentist chair a watermelon uh, and so forth so that the, the, the way that the lights lit up would indicate more or less whether they were thinking about a watermelon or about uh, a dentist chair and then you would slip that slide in because any one of these slides could go with any portion of the film they are in a certain order that was like convenient but uh, it was an attempt to sort of like employ some kind of feedback phenomena. But if that had ever been executed, it would be the most, uh, probably the most expensive uh, film presentation in history. It was executed to a degree in, in uh, Steinway Hall. Uh, that's how I, this Mr. Phipps did, uh, after Dr. Larry Rowling did set up a, uh, he gave me several thousand dollars to make a sort of a presentation of that. It was, it was done nicely. The whole thing was, was set up and done fairly elaborately, see. I, I don't think I ever did finish that sentence about the relation of surrealism to my things, that I assumed that something was controlling the course of action, that it was not simply arbitrary, so that by this sortilege of stuff, uh, which is, you know, there's a certain system of divination called sortilege, for example, mm -hmm that uh, everything would come out all right. Now, that, that last film was made more or less on that same basis, that uh, although I kept a sort of a record of such and such was shot in such and such a, a area of the screen. It was also, was it your decision to leave in the Kodak leaders in between films? Oh, something? sure, yeah. I got, although I stole that idea from Andy Warhol, I believe. <laughs> Certainly. And, and uh, everything that was shot was put in there except that a great number of the images are missing the, the stuff that the most effort was devoted to uh, doesn't even show at all see and uh... You mean material that was shot? oh yes I mean things that that, that uh, Peter Fleischman and I spent who made that film with me uh, were spent weeks shooting uh, objects that were, must have been all underexposed because I assumed that, that when uh, Agfa or whoever it is says that the film had a rating of whatever it is, 300 or something that it did have a rating of 300, it doesn't have a rating of 300, it has a rating of about 80 or something <laughs> and uh, so that most of the stuff that was shot on, on the beginning and the end of the film disappeared because of, of that See, it's all underexposed then the central portion of the film after it was shot, it was not developed for a long time. It was left lying around for about six months in hot weather, so that it all faded out and became white. I naturally, I like the effect of the thing. It's all black at the beginning and white in the middle. It looks good. And uh, Mr. Casper made extremely good prints of the middle part. They're better than the original, I believe. But uh, nonetheless, uh, what belong, uh, it's, it do didn't come out anything like I thought it was going to. Do you have time for a new film? Well, I had started to con to get people together for a film, you know, some months ago when I was going to get... How did that, I, did that start? I think I had asked Andy if he wanted to make a film. And uh, he said, uh, yes. <laughs> and uh, so that I said, well, can I have $300? He said, yeah. So that... Uh, mm -hmm. Then I, who was it I asked next? I think Jack Smith or somebody, if he wanted also to cooperate on this same film. And then possibly Robert Frank, I believe. I mean, I can't remember the order that these things develop, but at that point it seemed like ridiculous to mm -hmm. make a kind of amateur movie and, uh, but to make a really elaborate, sort of super underground movie to show in regular theaters, like neighborhood theaters. And uh, that would be the only one I would make, but it may take... I mean, that thing project keeps bogging down. Basically because I haven't been able to find anybody that knows enough about uh, films in regular theaters. Uh, where then various people would come in. See, it would be marvelous if, if uh, Andy, for example, was able to supervise 
beautiful color photograph of maybe a 20 minute color picture of say Mount Fuji or something uh, but it was a really good cameraman and technicians and everything so it was really beautiful you know and that uh, Stanley Vanderbeek was going to work on also on that thing uh, what I'd probably do with him is take him to northern Australia and have him animate uh, Australian Aboriginal bark paintings and that sort of thing see and we'd show the <laughs> material they'd already made, like I can imagine that the, say, the Amazonian Indians or the uh, Australian Aborigines would like uh, Andy's Eat movie or something on that order, you see. So that, that would be the film I'm playing, but I presume that, that uh, it'll, it probably will be eventually produced, that thing. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> so that, however, the next morning in the mail, a check did, did uh, come for $10,000, and he said, we, we didn't like Terrace Bobo at all, and we decided <laughs> to see if you could do better. <laughs> However, I took the money and went to Miami Beach and spent it instead of going to Hollywood. <laughs> and so he was a little... I've been afraid to phone them for a long time. And all the people that would be writing this, the script for this film, supposedly, would be William Burroughs and Jack Kerouac. And any, I suppose Alan Ginsberg would have be asked him to, but the thing is that uh, Really all I was trying to do was to get people who had names together. That was the fundamental notion of this film, was to get like people that had been, someone had read about in like Time or uh, Harper's Bazaar, whatever it is. So that it would, uh, I really would like to make a... So what would you do on the film? Just supervise them? Sort of, yeah. Would you do any animation? Or? I might make some, I'd undoubtedly t do some photographs of something, but I don't know what. Maybe maybe in the feather work in the Amazon or something. I don't think I'll make any more animated films, no. Unless it's many years from now. Because they're too laborious and, and uh, bad for the health and everything. I mean, it's just, you know, sitting under those enormous, I mean, they're like banks of lights for hours is uh, just, I mean, terrible. I don't think I'll make any more animated films. No, I've not done it. I've made enough of those. Just like I made enough. I'm not going to make any more hand-drawn on the film films. I made enough of those. Do you think you might do a photographic film of your own? Well, all, all your own. It would be. It. I might. Sure. I don't know. It depends on how things develop. I would like to make this other thing. I'd like to make a real. Uh, one of these underground movies that could be like shown in neighborhood theaters in little towns because it was seeing uh, art films or whatever they call them by myself that got me interested in these things now there must be lots of people all over the country or the world or something that would be uh, stimulated to make films if they saw some of the things that are being made so that naturally I would like to try to distribute things like Andy's films or Jack Smith's films more generally than they are. Naturally, I would like to make some kind of artistic film that would be helpful to uh, progress of humanity. And that's the best one I'm able to think of, because there's no doubt in my mind that uh, eventually these so-called underground movies are... somebody is going to make one for commercial distribution. Okay, I think I have enough material to keep me busy.